capture of the of the SOEs, capture of the SOEs look really easy. You just subvert the boards of directors through the political appointment process and then you've got the keys to, to the safe. And it looked easy because it is actually, it was actually that easy. Um, since then, there's been a cleanup underway. So we've had, you know, Tumamina, the New Dawn, um, President Ramaphosa, Minister Kevin Gordon, um, who have been turning around, cleaning up the state-owned enterprises. But also, as we all know, things haven't improved, and in fact, the collapse has accelerated. So my panelists are um, Lumkila Monde. He's a WITS academic and um, economist. He's a senior lecturer at the School of Economics and Business Science. And he's, he's from the front line. He's been a chief economist at the IDC, also at Transnet, right, Lumkile? Yes, yes. yes, Transnet too, um, a while ago, long before all of this happened. And, <laughs> and um, Professor Michael Sachs, who is um, adjunct professor at the Southern Centre for Inequality Studies at WITS, where he leads the centre's public economy project. He also serves as chair of the Fiscal and Finance Commission Deputy Chair, sorry, and he also, by the way, is on the state-owned, the presidential uh, state-owned entities council. And um, he's also from the front line. He's also previously with the Treasury for many years where he was head of the budget office. Great, so I'm going to ask them to sort of like do the talking and we're hoping for quite a lot of audience engagement, so please feel free. Um, Lumkila, please set the scene for us. So we've had Gordon and, and Ramaphosa doing the turnaround, right? Um, why hasn't it worked? Um, maybe firstly, let me allocate um, the, this, the, the process uh, of the transition. Uh, because historically, uh, the apartheid regime had set out uh, these SOEs for public value. Um, so whether it was in the transport sector um, um, or energy sector, even um, in, in 1966 uh, when um, P.W. Bother, then a minister uh, um, of, um, of defense, started the military um, uh, companies, Danel, Amsco, etc., the, all those were formed for purpose, for public value. So in the state of defense, it was for South African securities because it believed that there was a threat. So where things change uh, is that um, the, the, these entities sourced all their funding directly from parliament. So if it was telecoms, uh, the Minister of Telecommunication will take the budget from the general manager and then will go to parliament and get the budget approved. So the state uh, in 1994, following the, the, the growth, employment, and redistribution um, strategy, uh, had a huge um, a debt uh, problem. Um, I'm sure Michael will talk a bit uh, about that. And, and one of the issues of closing the deficit and lowering the debt uh, was to look at where money was. So the Treasury, under Maria Ramos as the DG, uh, basically pushed very hard for SOEs to be corporatized. So there's a huge shift. So, so when we came in, I joined, I joined Transnet in 1995. When you came in, we a minister, but we were governed by an old act. So in 1990, by 1990, there's a flurry of these policies, uh, the Legal Succession Act and many others, uh, who are trying to make these, um, these institutions uh, relevant and, and, and yet not corporatized. So Maria made us, uh, at least explain to all get corporatized. So by being uh, corporatized, it means the governance relationship changes. Then you're gonna need a board, et cetera. So linking then this history to the discussions that we've been having in the past few days, um, uh, Dr. Mbete yesterday, um, in her presentation, 
uh, around ministers and that they're members of parliament. Uh, and therefore, given that our constitution uh, expects uh, a multi, or at least uh, in this design, uh, um, is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, party or multi-party uh, democracy, and therefore allows all publicly uh, appointed representatives, the Muslim parliament, to act in the interest of the country uh, and the interest for public value, basically. So in, by changing and tweaking it uh, and demanding from SOEs, firstly, uh, that they pay dividend. So the first attack, in fact, before the corporation was how Transnet was raided by the Treasury. Uh, Transnet uh, had restructured and had about 2.7 billion rand um, uh, bonanza uh, from the Johannesburg um, uh, Consolidated Investment, JCI. Um, and there was no way where government could get this dividend um, because of the old act. So in corporatization uh, and, and moving forward, in fact, Transnet had to move very quickly uh, under Professor Tega, many of you might remember her, uh, who was the chairman of Transnet, to try and change the MMI so that Transnet, who was set up for public value, has to start paying a dividend to a government. So a huge flurry uh, between uh, Sakima Tozoma, the CEO, um, and, uh, Jeff Hatebe, who had just become in 1999, the new Minister of Public Enterprises, to try and amend OMI so that this 2.7 billion could be paid by uh, back. We pushed back because we thought that 2.7 billion was going to be used uh, for, to address the locomotive of Transnet, which I subject today uh, of the China uh, South Rail um, the, the battle. So the, that opportunity is lost, uh, and then in the process, dividend goes in. The reason why I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm pointing this picture, and I'm pitching, I'm, I'm putting all this uh, confusion that all of you are seeing, <laughs> is really uh, to highlight how a government uh, in its pursuit of access uh, to the balance sheet of this, uh, these, these SOEs that were profitable that could reinvest the money, but, but government wanted the money, then took the money away from these institutions set for public value for a dividend uh, to close the gap in the public, uh, in the public funds. Mm -hmm. Then that meant piercing the veil uh, by, by government, by making sure that going forward, we won't have the experience that we had with Tega. We'll, we'll make sure that the process allows uh, the minister uh, to have more power in how directors are appointed. By that, I mean the directors that are amenable uh, to c compromise the SOE uh, for the benefit of, of, of government in pursuit of its own goals. Right. This is something. So, so that's the history of it yeah. and, and what happened to these state-owned enterprises, why they were corporatized. And I think it's, it's critical because it was um, the start of these, these companies being able to access private funding, do transactions themselves. And that was expected. They were expected not to defend on the, on the fiscus. But also at the same time, they still did have a public service mandate. So there was a, that, that has been a little bit of a contradiction. But if we look at now, and we know, so now we see how badly that experiment went wrong, because you appointed politicians and you said, um, you're in charge, you appoint the boards, and these companies are going to be subject to the Companies Act, and, and they're going to be run for, for profit, and um, they're going to be run along business lines, and that was very badly subverted by the Jacob Zuma administration, where the crony um, directors were appointed and it became really that easy to steal, um, to steal, to steal Transnet, to steal ESCOM. Um, if we look at the new, uh, uh, the new era, uh, the Ramaphosa Gordon thing, what, what, why didn't they came in, they changed the people, they, they changed the boards, they changed the CEOs, they changed the execs, why didn't it work, Michael? So I think uh, Lumkile has actually uh, started with the answer, but didn't get to finish. No, didn't <laughs> <laughs> which is, which is uh, good of you, uh, because it gives me a chance to finish. I think the reason it didn't work is that it was based on the assumption 
that things were going okay until state capture came along. And when state capture came along, South Africa's kind of progress towards a bright, shiny future was derailed. Uh, and therefore, all that government needed to do was to reverse the particular maladies associated with state capture, and then we would be back on this shiny path. But actually, the problems go much deeper than state capture. And state capture, uh, one could see as probably more of an effect than a cause of the underlying problems. Uh, so I, I want to just give a very simple example which is very clear and explicit um, about this thinking. It was thought in between 2016 and 2019 that uh, SARS had been captured and Tom Moyani had been uh, appointed the Commissioner of Public Revenue and as a result tax revenue collapsed. Um, but in hindsight it's clear that that was not the problem at all. In fact ca state capture had very little impact on state revenue. The reason uh, um, public revenue collapsed between uh, 2016 and 2019 had a lot to do with underlying economic fundamentals. And so we see today a clean, shiny new administration of SARS, but still state revenue is collapsing. Uh, and so clearly corruption wasn't the problem. Not that corruption isn't a problem. It is a problem, but it is not the fundamental problem. Just to link back to what uh, Lumkile was saying, the idea behind corporatization is that public companies can be run as though they are private companies with exactly the same form of private companies. And private companies, in the structuring of private companies, there's an idea of a kind of principal agent problem, where the principal is the shareholder and the agent is the management of the company. So in modern capitalism, you have a separation of ownership and control and private sector governance structures are set up to overcome that problem. So the idea is if we set up a similar kind of governance structures for public companies, they would equally be able to, to solve these kinds of problems. But what is actually happening is a form of isomorphic mimicry to use an academic term, which comes from nature. It's when a, a, a natural, uh, when, a, when a, a flower pretends to be a female bee in order to attract male bees to come and take the pollen. Yeah. So here you have a form of uh, private sector relations, but the underlying content of the relationship is completely different. And the reason it's completely different is because of the identity of the shareholder that in the private sector, the shareholder is a person with skin in the game, a person who has put their own money on the table, and that money is at, at risk, and that's why they have to control the, the corporation. But in the government sector, um, it's not Praveen Gordon's money that is on the table. It's not Cyril Ramaphosa's money on the table. It's taxpayers' money. There's a soft budget constraint, and therefore, you need to think about a different kind of organizational relationship. And I would say the whole approach of corporatization and pretending that public companies can operate like private companies has essentially failed. And we need to really think outside the box about how public corporations are structured. Right. Yeah, I think that is, that's, that's a really valuable point. Um, and I can hear Lumkile agreeing with that. Um, and I definitely ag agree with that. I think that one of the other consequences of that treating state companies as private companies is that you've got the soft budget. Um, you haven't actually got the discipline of a shareholder. You haven't got the real <coughs> accountability um, that a shareholder holds. And um, you have a politician who is going to call the shots. So, so that is... Is, is a, it's, it's a difficult question, and I actually don't know, don't know how to solve it. Um, but just briefly, I just want to turn to what the Zondo Commission actually recommended. So the Zondo identified the problem. He identified the problem to be um, it's the way, it's who's on the boards. They, they, they sub the Gupta subverted the boards. Um, we need to now change that 
how the boards are appointed, and if we change that process, we're going to set state-owned enterprises on the road to growth. So his suggestion was that um, the, the, there should be a, a standing uh, appointment and oversight committee established, and this committee would have a retired judge, it would have a... Um, the Minister of Finance, and then it would have like various people from the professions um, nominated by the professions, an accountant, a lawyer, um, representatives of business and labor, an industry expert and an industry expert nominated by the SOE and somebody from an anti-corruption body. Now, Lumkile, let's just look briefly at that because that, that suggestion has not seen the light of day. Um, no one's entertained it seriously. Why is that? And, and what, what do you think um, of, that, of that proposal? Um, so it's, it's politics why it does not seem uh, the light of the day. Uh, because um, how do you deploy? In an environment where a majority party want to deploy cadres to this institution, how do we do it when we've got these other individuals who are sitting on it? So I don't think politically it's palatable. Um, however, I think again, in our discussions yesterday, um, they, there is a sense I get, I mean, from many of the conference uh, participants here, that we want to really make sure that uh, parliament plays this crucial uh, responsibility much stronger than it has, it has in the past. So in doing so, we want to make sure that it becomes also accessible uh, to us uh, as professionals, but also to the broader public, so that when all processes of appointment um, go through that, but let it board level, uh, go through that process, uh, then they allow us uh, to invite, get invited also uh, to make questions, to, to ask questions. Uh, in the process of appointment. So for me, it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, if we're going to bring back a new constitutional um, framework, this, this might be the way to go. Uh, and it brings then back again the minister uh, to, to account to parliament and engage with their colleagues, which they don't do so much at the moment. There's more engagement with the executive because in their mind, they think they are executives when in fact they're ministers and are supposed to be members of parliament. So that will bring them back here and that process will be able to have efficiencies. Uh, even if the process might be flawed, but at least the fact that many of us can participate, uh, it will go a long way uh, to, 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 uh, to, uh, for accountability. So, so, I mean, I think they're two separate questions really and I just blurred them into one. Um, why I didn't see the light of day? Yes, politics. Uh, cabinet ministers are not going to give up on their ability to deploy in state-owned enterprise, a very valuable tool for them. Um, but, but also, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a very practical um, suggestion. So you're saying that, um, yes, it, it's a bit better. It's a bit better than, than what we've got because there would be some sort of public process or we could do some sort of public parliamentary process um, to, to make these board appointments. Um, Michael, what do you think of, of both the Zondo Commission suggestion and the suggestion that maybe it should be Parliament that, that does these kind of I, I think I think that in principle, so, so what happened that was terrible under the Zuma administration was the ability to appoint cronies to these boards in a very untransparent, opaque manner. Uh, and not be held accountable and these public institutions because they were conceived of as private institutions uh, were not subject to the kind of public scrutiny that you would get for instance when you appoint a public protector now that so so some solution to that problem I would imagine is low-hanging fruit that should be there whether you set up a new kind of institution or whether you ask Parliament to do it I think is a secondary question, but certainly people who get appointed to the boards of Transnet or ESCOM or these large public institutions, there should be some transparent public process that uh, will not guarantee that those will be decent people, uh, but uh, at least it, it would be open and transparent. Is it? Is that? So I think we should look at it, uh, implementing the substance of 
of Zondo's recommendation, if not the, the details the of it. The detail, right. Okay, so some kind of transparency. I mean, uh, one of the things that worries me is that, um, you know, these, in, these organizations, these companies, they actually, they have reached a level of sophistication that, that, um, that it requires a level of sophistication to run those companies and a level of knowledge that um, not, not everyone has. And I think that that's particularly what has happened in this last, if we look at this last period and we look at, say, Transnet, for instance, where um, we came, they, they came in with a, with, with, a clean, um, with a clean board, with a clean management. They got actually cleared out all the other management assumption. They're all corrupt. So literally everybody went out on VSPs, hundreds of people. Um, and they were left with, with absolutely, firstly, no capacity. And then by deploying two people, I'm talking about uh, Portia Darby and Cesar Kele Mzamela, by deploying them, who were trusted, they're trusted people, they're part of us, they're part of the, the ANC the right government, faction. they're part of us, you know, by appointing them because we trust them, not because they have any experience in logistics, any experience in rail. Neither, ha both had neither and how, how badly that has gone wrong. So, so taking a commitment to say, we're not, these are not corrupt people, these, co these are not corruptible people, we know that, um, we put them there, but, but even that didn't solve, didn't solve the problem. Um, and, and so I don't really know how we solve the problem of, you know, in a private company you have, you have accountability to the shareholders because the shareholders have got money in the game and so they will um, remove you if you, whereas if you're the minister, you appointed them because you like them, you trust them, you want them. It took three years to remove them when people were telling Praveen Gordon for the last three years they don't know what they're doing. I think, uh, I mean, uh, Lumkile maybe will add on Transnet, which I don't know very little about, but again, I, I would think that the problem, for instance, with ESCOM is not, uh, it, it cannot be solved by point, uh, appointing the right CEO and the right board. The problem with ESCOM is that it is a vertically integrated monopoly presiding over a coal-based, outdated, antiquated electricity supply system. So what needs to happen is a fundamental restructuring of ESCOM, which I think most people agree with. And we can argue about what's the extent of private or public ownership in that restructuring and everything. But the whole way ESCOM is set up, given the underlying technological changes that it's taking place, is, is a disaster that cannot be solved by having uh, a white knight appointed as a CEO, as we can clearly see. It needs a fundamental program of restructuring. Let me use another example, Prasa. Prasa was allocated between, when it was formed around 2007, 2008, and 2018, 19, it was allocated 110 billion rand in capital subsidies out of the fiscus. And at the end of that 10-year period, it had no capital. Its railway lines had been stolen and it had entirely collapsed. Now, it's kind of a no-brainer that the solution to the problem in Prasa is to deset, to, to break up Prasa, give the Gauteng elements to be run together with the Gau train, uh, give the Cape Town elements to be run by somebody in Cape Town, whether it's the province or the city, and maybe, so you need a process of restructuring, which is a difficult policy uh, reform agenda, which is difficult to carry out. It's much easier to just say, let's fix the problem of governance and leave it as it is, and the, the new good board of, of people with integrity will solve the problem. I don't think they will. Yeah. Kila, your, your, your view on the, the structure, the systemic problems, the structure of these enterprises. Yes. So, in a country like South Africa, where uh, the majority of people um, live under the most difficult conditions. So we have got a structural inequality in, in our country with high levels of unemployment in our country. Uh, therefore, there is a role for institutions for public value. Um, and those institutions for public value uh, require um, to be some, sub, some form of subsidization. Um, so therefore, the, uh, my argument is that the historical architecture 
uh, of these SOEs made a lot of sense to me. Because what we had was that your profit making uh, the public institution subsidized the public value institution. So in the case of the port monopoly, uh, then, uh, before it was split, uh, the, the, the port authority. The port authority is a monopoly, it just sucks in uh, rents. Um, and those rents then are used to subsidize public value institution. For example, uh, a, a, um, a public or a commuter rail system. Because we know this is a mass transit uh, system and most of the people that use it are the poorest of the poor. So the state is not bad in with that because we, we, we're, we're taxing someone or we're extracting rents, we use those rents to, to do that. So once you, you, you corporatize and your focus is on profit because you want dividends or you want these to stand on their own, you basically are moving them away for the responsibility of public value. So we lose all the public value. What remains are the profit motive um, that, that, that are there, and they'll go for where money is, because they want to make money. So there's, a, there's an issue around how you set up SOEs for public value um, going forward, because you also cannot rely on taxes. So there must be someone who's extracting rent somewhere, uh, and that rent is, is used to subsidize. Secondly, um, in, 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 in relation to uh, what, 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 what Michael was talking about on, on ESCOM. At Transnet, uh, which we saw, we've seen again in Transnet, so one of the things that South Africa is, is good at is policymakers jumping immediately uh, on the same business uh, to run them without any expertise. So we saw with Maria Ramos uh, and her team, we saw with uh, Brian Mulife, all these, uh, remember, some of these SOEs are highly capital intensive. Uh, I, I know that the CEO doesn't do the work, but if you understand what goes on, it, it's one job well done, because then you can be able to, to marshal uh, the other support that makes it uh, do good uh, for public. So, so South Africa has got that very, very wrong. And the private sector also is very good at, at promoting this because we've seen quite a number of Michael's colleagues, for example, who will move from treasury, go straight to the bank. Um, and this can't be right. This cannot be right. So you're creating these institutions where, uh, where capture and corruption uh, are easy to happen because of these. Or in the case of the SOEs, you bring in capability and you just incapacitate, incapacitate the institution because they've got leadership that's got no clue. Therefore, the economy is burdened with the problem that's got today. So we need to look at these uh, operationally and how we use these critical resources where they're supposed to be used so that we can make them run, so that for public value, we can be able to make a difference at the poorest of the poor. Because public institution, yes, about the broader economy, but at the end of the day, about inclusion. If we are thinking about even ESCOM, as we break down, the biggest question is about what about the poor? And no one in that discussion, Michael, in the, in the breaking down of ESCOM is talking about the poor. Uh, and we know that we come from a history of exclusion. That's why in many communities, the power is out for three months. People go on, they don't even go and strike because they've seen it before. They didn't have electricity. So they can sit under those worst conditions because that's what it's been. Thank you. You know, I, th I think that, that um, so, so in Transnet, interestingly, um, there is, there is, in the transport sector, there is exactly the same kind of big reform that is happening in ESCOM, the, 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 the you know, disaggregation and, and dividing up the company. So that is, is underway, but these are massive reforms and, they, and they, 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 they take time and they are, they, they demand a lot of expertise and we've now got a state which, which doesn't have that expertise and um, which is running very short of money. And all of these things do need money. You know, if you want to, if you want to subsidize a proper commuter rail system, the state, that should be something that is coming out of tax money, and yet the, at this point there's no tax money to, to be had um, for, for that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's not as if, um, just in, you know, what, so what government has done since, since, since 2018, since Zondo, um, they haven't done nothing. They didn't just ignore the, the Zonda commissions. What they've done is the president in, in 2020, he set up a, 
a state-owned a state-owned enterprises council, um, and that council, um, according to Praveen Gordon, emerged with a proposal, a proposal that these state-owned enterprises be dramatically restructured. So I'm going to ask Michael just to give us a little briefing on like what is that proposal with the holding company, and um, and all of the state-owned enterprises becoming subsidiaries, and 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 will it? Does it solve the problem? Does it, will it work? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think it is an attempt to appear to be doing something in order to avoid doing what needs to be done. Uh, because, um, I mean, to be, to be honest, I, I really don't understand what is the problem that maybe this... Just, maybe just explain first, what, it, what is the proposal? I don't know if everyone would be familiar. Yeah, maybe you will explain it better <laughs> than me. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so the proposal is, the bill has been published last month. It's called the State-Owned Enterprises Bill. And the proposal is that all the commercial or strategic state-owned enterprises are taken away from their line departments and they're put under a holding company, which is run like strictly on sort of commercial management lines with professional management. And... Um, this, these are supposed to be then entities that can attract funding, they can go to the markets and borrow money, and they can, um, they can, get, they can attract investors, they could even be listed, um, people could buy stocks in them, it, big investors could come along and buy stakes in them, there could be partnerships, so this is, this is the vision. Um, and, and I think, and, and so the solution to this political capture tendency um, in the bill is that well, instead of, um, we'll sep that's what we'll do. We'll separate out the policy functions from the actual shareholder functions. So the shareholder functions will all go into the holding company and the policy functions will stay with the Department of Transport, with the Department of um, Energy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that's, that's the dream, that's the idea, and, it's, and it is a well-tested model. Uh, China, Malaysia, Singapore, it's working. Um, but in our case, what Pravin Gordon has proposed in this bill is that the, the, that the directors of this holding company are appointed by the president. And I think that that's, that's, yeah, that's in a nutshell the, the, um, the, the proposal. And I guess because if it's a holding company, the directors of that company would then appoint the directors of all of the subsidiaries. So, so the reason it makes no sense whatsoever to me is, uh, and I think it's another example of this uh, isomorphic mimicry, is that if you look at China, Isomorphic. if you look at uh, um, uh, Singapore, Temasek, fine, there's a holding company, and that company holds equity. Uh, but that equity that it holds is an actual real thing that is traded in a stock market because all of those companies are partly owned by the government but also have shares that are publicly traded, uh, somewhat similar to telecom, you might say. So if we had a whole series of companies that are similar to telecom, which are, have public listings on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, that public listing is the thing that is making the company transparent and making it account to investors who again have skin in the game. And then you locate all of that e equity in a holding company that is able to trade and act as the shareholder. Now, what is equity in ESCOM? What, what does that mean? What will the holding company hold? Uh, there's nothing like equity in ESCOM. There's no financial instrument that can be traded called equity in ESCOM. It may be a model to move forward, and many people are proposing this, that you move towards a situation where state-owned companies, as is the case in China or Singapore, are listed on the stock exchange. And the process of preparing a state-owned company for listing on the stock exchange, again, would be a very difficult and complex process that would force you to sort out the financials, sort out the governance, and prepare that company for listing. So much so that once you arrived at that point of listing, you would have done so much work that maybe even the listing wouldn't uh, be necessary. But instead of going down that path, you decide to, to establish a holding company without proposing any serious uh, uh, process of reforming the underlying assets that the company is holding. And so all it really amounts to in my mind is instead of privatizing the state-owned companies, we're privatizing the Department of Public Enterprises. 
and the Department of Public Enterprises now will be a private company, and that means that the salaries of the officials who work there can be market-related. You can have very high-paying people working there. And, and so, but the basic relationship between the Department of Public Enterprises and the companies that it oversees, I don't see how it changes in any significant way. Mm. And Lumkili, does the political dynamic change if, if the president appoints um, the directors of the holding company rather than the, the line minister and the cabinet? How does that um, make things better? Um, we had a, a discussion again, I'm borrowing from yesterday's discussion in relation uh, to our colleagues uh, who are here um, working for our prosecuting authorities. Uh, uh, and they're very clear that, you know, that does not create any conflict. They, 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 they shared with us that, you know, they act independently as expected <coughs> Uh, by the Constitution. So I think even in that case, if the President appointed uh, whoever, uh, it will, uh, the President will allow those to act in the interest of the entity. What if the, what if the President was Jacob Zuma? Um, so, uh, that, <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> so that, going back to that, uh, to that uh, uh, other discussion with Michael, uh, in relation to the holding, sh uh, holding company, uh, again, uh, there is no lessons that have been learned, uh, Michael, in relation to how South Africa historically uh, had five big conglomerates. Uh, we had five, uh, many of you will remember, they are private sector conglomerates, so not pu public, the private sector. And embedded in them, uh, I mean, the late Joss Casson, um, who um, researched these, uh, these conglomerates, um, and the inefficiencies in building them. They'll argue that they were inefficient because they're not allowed to take money outside, so that's the argument. But they have such good lessons about governance and the reason why they had to unbundle. Because when you unbundle and eventually privatize, uh, as you're saying, Michael, then everyone who participates knows what they're buying. You know, if I'm buying, let's say, uh, uh, Brasa, uh, the, 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 the commuter rate part of it, uh, I know I'm buying Prasa, but also I may not want to buy Prasa. I may want to buy the Cape Town line. So I want to buy all the, 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 the Cape Town metro line because I think they're profitable. And so, so it's very important for us not to have these uh, ideas of uh, agglomeration and, um, that seem to take us backward to the old conglomerates that we had and the efficiencies and the inefficiencies and complexities that they bring that would simplify, as Michael was saying in the case of ESCOM, that, you know, uh, break the thing down, let's know who's inefficient, let's know what price we're paying, where, and if there are problems around public value and access by the, uh, by the poor, then we can find solutions as to what can, be, can, what can we do to make sure that the poor aren't marginalized and can have access. If you, conglo if you conglo make conglomeration, then it brings us too many complexities and inefficiencies. So the holding company thing, I don't, I don't support uh, in our environment. Right. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to open it for questions. And um, please, let's try and stick to the issues. Um, you know, will it work? Will this state holding company thing work? Um, should the president be the appointing person? Um, why have the state-owned enter enterprises failed? Um, Judge Crickler's really shake his head there about the president. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, over to you. Okay, Dave. Can I ask, yeah. how can we listen to half an hour and nobody has spoken about theft? The SOEs have gone to the wall because they've been stolen blind. That's not because of incompetent boards or because they weren't listed on the stock exchange or they should have been unbundled and were bundled or whatever. It's because they were... Al but providing a living for tens of thousands of supporters of the government who were stealing for their own benefit. They will continue to do so unless you address that problem. Thank you. So now I'm going to get Michael to respond to that in a while because that's exactly what he was saying was not, obviously theft is a problem and corruption a problem, but it's, it's more than that. Okay, Dave, Dave Lewis. Yeah, you know, I don't agree with Lumkine or Michael. You know, I don't. I don't think I even. <laughs> I don't think I even agree with uh, with Judge Krichler. 
Um, uh, my experience of state-owned enterprises, and, and I've been on the board of two state-owned enterprises, is completely different. You know, when, when, when I was on the board of, of, uh, of, of the IDC, we were, this was the first post-apartheid board of the IDC. Uh, the, the new minister, who was Trevor Manuel, in fact, at the time, um, ap appointed to the board some of his cronies, of which I was one, who, who, who knew, but who knew something about industrial policy. We never managed a, a large company before or directed a large company before, but we knew about industrial policy. So we were the kind of public interest representatives on the board, a group of about four or five people. And, and, but also on the board was Christo Visser, Maya Khan, G.T. Ferreira, people who knew a thing or two about running a large company. So when the thing started, they looked after the money to see that we didn't bankrupt the company. And we looked after the public interest. And very soon we were both looking after the public interest and the, and the money. And critically, the minister who then became Alec Irwin very soon after this, didn't interfere with us. He appointed the board. We appointed the CEO. He didn't appoint the CEO. We decided the big strategic questions, as long as they were broadly in line with the mandate that he, that he, that he gave us. Sometimes he disagreed with our strategic uh, decisions. Like he wanted a pebble bed mo modular nuclear reactor. We didn't agree. Um, it was too expensive and we didn't think it was going to work. And so the board turned it down. Um, and, uh, and he could do nothing about it and he did nothing about it because we, we weren't, uh, with respect, the kind of people who could be just pushed around. Certainly the, the Vises and the Ferreras weren't, but, but nor, nor were the public representatives who were appointed to the board. And the same thing happened in South African Airways. When Barbara Hogan appointed the board, she appointed people from the private sector who knew a thing or two about running a company, and she appointed people who were public representatives, if, if you like. And it worked perfectly until M Malusi Gigaba made it impossible to stay on that, on that board. But it was a company in real crisis that the directors and the board could have sorted out. And I really don't believe the stuff about not having skin in the game. I think that's a really, really conservative, conservative notion. Of course a minister has skin in the game. I don't think he or she should be called a shareholder. I think they should be called a public representative. But they're a very high public representative of a country that is committed to serving the poor and to, um, uh, uh, to sorry, to, 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 to serving the poor and to industrial policy. I mean, that's the bizarre thing about how the public enterprises are being treated. They were potentially the, the key instruments of the policy that government attached its standard to, namely to industrial policy. And instead, they just screwed them up. And they did so because of the way in which they appointed the leadership of those companies. There's not any rocket science about this. The, 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 the shareholder, in this case, the public representative minister, um, appoints the board. He or she provides the board with a mandate. The, the, the board translates that mandate into a strategy. It appoints a CEO and executives who are responsible for operationalizing that strategy. And everybody stays in their lanes. That doesn't happen anymore. You know, you know, Pravin Gordon is he, he 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 appoints the CEOs and the and the CFOs of the of the of the company. So they're not accountable. The CFO is not accountable to the CEO. The CEO is not accountable to the board. They're both accountable to the, to the minister, and the boards are just there for window dressing. And for the most part, they are lousy boards. They're boards who don't know anything about uh, uh, running okay, so, the... So, Dave, tell us what the solution is. The solution, How do you get this? Solution, How do you get to the solution? The, 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 the you know, you want to appoint like good people. How do you solution, make sure they're good people? The solution is, is, is it lies in governance. There's no... There's no 
rocket science about any of the big strategic decisions that have to be taken. They weren't in South African Airways, they're not in, in Prasa. Boards take those kind of decisions all the time. The idea is point boards on merit, point uh, quality boards, and then leave them to do their business. I've heard, uh, just let me finish, I've heard a lot of good things about the, the new chairperson of, of, the, of the ESCOM board, not somebody that I have ever met or, or know. If he is, as he is said, I want to see how long he lasts with a minister who tells him what to do. I also want to see how long do. he lasts. I also want to. Because, because <laughs> that's the, the problem, you know. So we've got that view. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have question, answer, question, answer, because otherwise, so we can keep the momentum. So I'm going to get Michael Gulam, I've got you and I've got you. Um, I'm going to get and got you. Um, I'm going to get Michael to respond to Judge Krichler and to, to Dave um, first, and then we'll move on to other questions. So, um, uh, I, I mean, it's a variant of the very thing I was criticizing at the beginning that we were so great in the 1990s. We all had it uh, sewn up and we were doing things so well. And then along came Zuma and bad practices and the ANC changed. And if only we could go back to those glory days and have Dave Lewis and Christo Visa on the board, there wouldn't be any problem. And I think that's fun fundamentally blinkered and wrong. Because it may be true that the idea, I mean, so part of the problem with this debate is the framing of the debate around the concept of SOCs, state-owned companies. Because the IDC isn't a state-owned company. It's a development finance institution. It's done very well. DBSA is also performing quite well. The land bank has been in chaos for a very long time. And it's not clear to me that the reason the land bank is failing is because wrong people have been appointed to the board. There are fundamental underlying re uh, issues around agricultural finance that require an answer of restructuring the land bank. Uh, the same with ESCOM. It's not about the board. It's, uh, um, there, there are fundamental problems in South Africa's electricity supply industry from the top to the bottom. It's got very little to do with theft. Uh, government has, a, has constituencies it has to answer to. Uh, IDC doesn't employ workers, but in ESCOM you employ a lot of workers who are members of trade unions. When the uh, CEO of ESCOM a few years ago tried to enter into an tried to impose unilaterally on unions a wage settlement, he was undermined and fired by the very same government. So there are incentives that are driving these behaviors that rest on the way institutions are structured. And I'm not arguing that it wouldn't be good to have good people on boards. It's definitely important to have good people and, and you know, people with expertise, people with the right view, people from the private sector, from white monopoly capital sitting on the boards, fantastic. But there are actually more fundamental problems in the restructuring of these large sectors of the economy, logistics and electricity, which are presided over by the public sector and are essentially holding back the country's development. So we need a project of reforming the institutions uh, in those sectors. So I don't think it's theft at all. I don't agree with uh, Justice Krikler at all. There may be theft. Uh, there may not be theft. But that is not the fundamental problem as... Okay, so the railway lines have been stolen, but not by the Board of Transnet. It's not Transnet that is doing the theft. It's the theft that is emerging from society, the redistribution of those railway lines into exports or informal settlements or wherever they're going, that is the problem. So that is a very big problem uh, that needs to be solved, yes. But the idea that things were hunky-dory until you had bad people in charge, I think is, uh, uh, under, underestimates this, the, the, the extent of the problem and where we started. We, we came with Tuma Mina, we appointed decent people to the board, we appointed these great new CEOs of Transnet. Three years later, the situation is considerably worse than it was uh, before we started. Great, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you and yeah, you first, and then we'll have a response, thanks. Um, so it strikes me that the, the challenge facing us is to kind of bring these two views together and think the reforms 
together. So you have you have a reform, you have a governance problem, and and I mean, Michael, I don't think you've done a, done a good enough job to defend your view against that. But you also have a major model problem. So I think we, I'm like I think the view that both of you started with was the right view to you know to begin the conversation with. There's a profound problem with the model of our state-owned enterprises, how we think about the shareholder and how they exercise that what we want to be a strategic direction or a programmatic vision for state-owned enterprises. And, and that was messed up from the beginning, and I agree. So I agree that the fundamental problem of why ESCOM hasn't enabled a, a strong economy is not a state capture problem. But we also have a state capture problem. That's so true. analogous to the procurement challenge we're faced with, that, that is that we have to get procurement working strategically and we have to make it less open to corruption. These are two intersecting problems. They feed off each other. And you know, it's a, it's a kind of vicious cycle. So we can't fix the procurement system by having a beneficial ownership register, for example, or having open contracting, right? But we need those things. We also need to have things that actually you know, we take the risk and we open up procurement to become more strategic, allow for more kind of room for flexible procurement, right? And then we put the right guardrails on. Okay, so that's, that's thinking through the strategic problem of procurement and its role in the economy in relation to, but also in tandem with the anti-corruption and governance problem. So the same challenge faces us with state-owned enterprises, okay? We have a fundamental problem with the model. The model is not allowing us to drive the economy. And I totally agree that we can't put that all down to state capture. In fact, maybe not like even 80%, I don't know. But we do have a governance problem. So, for example, the proposals made by Zondor, I think, overemphasize the anti-corruption angle, right? So that, that standing appoint, the, the sort of makeup of that board that's proposed, that oversight committee, it's an integrity committee, really. And you can't run you know, state-owned enterprises, you can't choose leadership of state-owned enterprises through an anti-corruption approach, you can't. So my view is that those, but there's some principles there for thinking about how we introduce checks and balances to address the governance problem while thinking through the complete restructure of state-owned enterprises. And I, I do think that pushing the speakers to respond to that twin challenge and how they intersect. Thanks, I think that was the voice of reason. Um, Lumkila, do you want to <laughs> respond? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the, the questions that you're asking are, are very complex. Uh, are complex in the sense that um, the, what, what Fine and Rastomje calls a minerals and energy complex is those relationship uh, between private sector companies uh, and the state. Uh, in South Africa's uh, industrialization process. Uh, cheap black labor, uh, cheap electricity, uh, and huge rents coming from the mines, um, as well as industry. Um, so, so this is the history that we have uh, of a state that has been captured historically uh, in, the apart, in, the, in the apartheid economy uh, that, that I've described. So um, because of the history of economic exclusion, uh, of black South Africans. The entry to different sectors is very, very hard because of access to capital. So for black entrepreneurs, access to capital is still a big problem, despite uh, Dave Lewis's attempts as a board member and others uh, in different financing institutions. So therefore, it makes sense that black entrepreneurs are attracted to state institutions to make business. Because at least there, I know Michael works at Treasury, Michael is a comrade. Michael, if I go to him, I may have access to an opportunity. I will help. So, <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is that, th so, so therefore, a lot of black entrepreneurs survive on access to state institutions across all levels. So the biggest, one, one of the issues that are debatable around South Africa's deindustrialization process, uh, uh, which um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, talks to very, very well in a, in a thesis called How We Lost Things in the Fire. Um, um, the oh. former? Yeah. Nimrod. Zag, Nimrod Zag. So Nimrod really uh, uh, makes a, an argument that this process that I've, uh, I've outlined where black entrepreneurs who don't have a history of industrialization because of our history um, and therefore are faced with these build programs that we're talking about uh, and Zonda's talking about of uh, 
of Transnet, ESCOM, etc., building infrastructure. They're, they're forced to go to bed with foreigners. In the process, you destroy your own capabilities um, and have the problems that we have in South Africa. So what I'm saying to you that your questions are very, very important uh, because you're talking about governance. So the argument that I'm trying to put here is that probably it's not even about governance. It is about the structure of the economy. That the fact that blacks remain isolated uh, in the mainstream of the economy, outside state entities, therefore it forces the procurement process to be the way it is, and in the process allows opportunists uh, or rent seekers to exploit that process and leading to these complexities. So until we address the bigger structure of the economy, where black entrepreneurs have got access outside the state to the larger economy, that then will limit some of these challenges that you face in our economy. Mm -hmm. I'm giving you a, a different argument. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Lumkile. Um, okay, um, Gulam. Uh, thanks, Chair. I mean, I think uh, to start off, we must start off with the point that Michael Sachs made. You know, somehow Polokwane uh, and the commodity boom it's distracted us from the big economic problems we had. We had a labor market that was mainly semi-skilled, unskilled. Uh, we had huge seas of poverty. I just want to interrupt and say, Gulam didn't in introduce himself, oh, but sorry, at this I'm time he was working in the presidency as an economic advisor. <laughs> okay, sorry. I mean, that in a sense, uh, we need to rethink the challenges we had in '94. We still have some of those problems, like a labor market that's largely unskilled, semi-skilled, unemployment, poverty, etc. But we can't solve all that problem through procurement systems or SOEs. We must keep that at the back of our mind. For example, just give you one example. I mean, the, uh, our transport is essentially catered to help bulk exporters. They don't really privilege higher valued exporters. So that's something that uh, uh, Dave would have been quite thinking about around 94, 98. We keep that at the back of our mind. Don't forget that. But we now need to work out how to solve Transnet. How, and to solve Transnet, we need to, in a sense, move back to what was, in a sense, intended way back when Maria Ramos corporatized it. I think uh, it may be in the interest of the state uh, for you to just give, like they gave SAA, uh, to give Transnet to the uh, big exporters. Uh, let them sort out the problem. The state can worry about regulation and things like that. At the moment, with the largely dysfunctional state, very little state capacity, uh, we need to see how we creatively use some of the strengths that the private sector have. We know that a private sector, uh, the essential motive is profit, but we can, in, in a sense, even begin to see uh, how one can regulate that in regards to SOEs. We can say uh, they can't make a profit higher than the treasury rate, uh, for example, in a sense, so we can peg the amount of profit they make. Uh, we can use a similar kind of strength that the private sector have, for example, in the health system. Uh, how can we use them to manage our public health system uh, so they run more efficiently? Uh, and we know a lot of the corruption in the private health system is around procurement. Uh, so my feeling is that maybe we need to, in a sense, same with ESCOM, let's give ESCOM to the bulk users and then we regulate the price that ESCOM will charge to the small users, How, what ESCOM will charge to new entrants into manufacturing or wherever. So my feeling is that we need to look much more creatively and think out of the box uh, to sort out the problems that we have today. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Ghulam. I, th I think that, yeah, you're welcome to clap, Dave. <laughs> I, I think that um, what we're what we kind of coming to here is that um, we've, we've had, we definitely had um, the nine lost years because the nine lost years and, and even the last five lost years, um, were these problems were not looked at. And this is actually where the problems of the economy lie. You need to restructure these, these entities. And, and unfortunately, now the state is restructuring them from a real point of weakness. So you say, um, you know, let's bring in the private sector. Yes, the private sector are coming because there is no other option at, at this point. Um, does either of you want to respond to, to Gulam? Could I come in on that point? No, wait. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, okay, you can, you can. You can if it's on the same thing, you can. Okay, please introduce yourself, uh, Riyad. Riyad Desai, I'm here to speak as an activist and I, I'm lucky I don't have problems of Karam or other people who are involved in some of the state agencies where I can speak my mind. Um, I think the assumption you're making, Carol, uh, is not taking on into account some of the points Mkili raised about, uh, you know, and, and I think that this assumption is it's not enough money. We don't have the money. And that somehow, you know, again, Monday and Tuesday, I was sitting with the uh, Department of Water and Sanitation officials from the national office. The same, all the, there's a lack of imagination. There's a lack of political imagination. Why were our SOEs corporatized in the first place was the crisis of profitability. This is the essential reasoning you know, of, of the international capitalism, which South Africa is obviously doesn't exist in isolation from. So we have a situation where we think we're going to stabilize our state-owned economies by entering into a system which is deeply, intrinsically unstable. And if we listen to Judge Crickler, with all respect, and Dave Lewis, it's the donor discourse. Good governance and human rights, and we're sorted out. We don't look at the political economy, which Michael is indirectly speaking to in, in some vague terms. Lumkili is uh, dealing with a bit more directly, and I think that's the problem we're faced. If we are unable to talk about wealth tax, incorporate, uh, uh, raising corporate taxation and so on, we're always stuck in this situation where we've got a very limited fiscus and very little room to, to move, and as a contribution earlier made, to actually drive the economy in the direction we need to begin to. So I, I, I'm really worried about the assumptions coming from, from the top there, and particularly from yourself, Carol, about you know, money, yes. money. Thanks. It's just like a iron okay. discipline. We, we, yeah. I'm going to let the panelists respond to all of that. But just I'll also say my bit. And let me just say that um, I was asked by the organizers not to just be a chair, but also to participate. So this is why I'm actually participating, in case anyone thinks I'm chairing very <laughs> uh, unfairly. <coughs> um, <coughs> just in response, I mean, my, my point is more that there are no other, other choices at this point. Um, it's exactly because if you want that those trains to run, who's going to run them? And that's the point we've reached where we're out of choices. Unfortunately, that's my that's my argument. I'm not saying it's going to be good for the country. It's going to be bad for the country. It's going to be good for the poor. It's going to be bad for the poor. I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm just saying that's this is where we're at. But we okay. Yeah, well, capitalism, look, are we waiting for you? <coughs> we are waiting for you to overthrow capitalism, and you still haven't done it. Um, can, can, can you, can you, <laughs> okay, can, can you, can you go, uh, Lumkile? Yeah. So, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, Kulam, uh, it's fascinating what you're raising, because already we're seeing it in the mining sector, where the mines are providing water, uh, they're providing roads, because they, because they know if they don't do it with the state failing, they'll be the first one to be attacked that they're stealing the water that's supposed to go to communities. So the sad part is that um, we're going back to where we came from. So many of you know that uh, only in 1872 uh, with the Natal Railways and 1877 with the Cape Railways, which both are under private hands, that the government nationalized these assets. Uh, towards the formation of what today is called Transnet. Similarly, um, in 1948, uh, uh, the dream of Van der Beel uh, is reached when all the generation assets of private sector of electricity are nationalized and put into ESCOM, of course, with some compensation. So what I'm saying to, uh, to everyone is that 
the capabilities, um, if we not develop, you, you need to go to where the capabilities are. And I think uh, those that nationalize these assets I've talked about understood that the state had no capability. And I think our, uh, President Ramaphosa understands that, that you know, we're limited today. We cannot do a lot of things. Therefore, let's bring the private sector. So to your point, Kulam, I think the Mineral Council has to rise uh, and address some of these uh, issues in relation to the export lines, both the Sessions export line and the Richard Bay uh, uh, um, um, export line. And that can galvanize then how we, we link them up to, to commuter uh, in the process, but using at least those articles resources to help us do that. Maybe uh, my, my great-grandchildren can think about taking them back again uh, to public. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Yeah, no, I, I sympathize with Carol's position in the, in the following sense. I'll put it in the following sense. I, you know, um, me and Rihard go back a long time to, to barricades uh, in all kinds of places. But, um, you know, tax revenue in South Africa and the whole buoyancy of the economy depends fundamentally on commodity exports. And when you reach a point where the public utility or the public company that is supposed to transport coal to, the, to export cannot transport the coal to export, you reach a point where, as Deng Xiaoping put it, it doesn't matter whether it's a black cat or a white cat as long as it catches the mouse. <laughs> and uh, so the, 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 resort, the, the, the state's back is against the wall because of fundamental political economy issues. But we're going to make it much worse if we remain, if we, if we allow ideology to come in, if the private, if mining, the mining sector can get the coal to the ports, let the mining sector get the coal to the ports. As I said, I think part of the problem here is uh, this category, this rubric, rubric called state-owned companies. And we're actually talking about fundamentally different things uh, under this rubric. So I sit on the board of something called the National Health Laboratory Services. And if you look at the history of the NHLS, some people say it's the ESCOM of the public health sector. And very much the problem in the NHLS that emerged a few years ago was about the board and board appointments and uh, theft and all of these things emerged. And it was solved and now the NHLS is fixed with a good, decent board and, and, and management. But uh, there are fundamental problems that are rising up uh, that require reforms in that sector that we need to address. Electricity, there are fundamental issues of commodification. Uh, corporatization went together with the assumption that electricity would be a commodity that would be sold to those who, who can afford to pay. And instead, because of the political economy of our development, essentially electricity is being given or distributed for free. It's being distributed, those municipalities that distribute electricity are not collecting any uh, uh, user charges for the electricity, including from the middle class who can afford to pay. Those uh, municipalities that don't distribute their own electricity are not paying ESCOM for the electricity. So there's fundamental restructuring of the electricity supply industry that needs to take place. And I think we need a more 21st century debate about the relationship between the market and the state and regulations and public institutions and private institutions. You know, the, the biggest state-owned company, so-called in, in Britain, is called Transport for London. It sells a commodity which allows people to travel around the city. It's run, every single line on Transport for London is concession to the private sector. There are debates to be had, but fundamentally the system is working for a public purpose. And we need to be more, we need to come out of this box of public versus private and be more creative maybe as Gulam is saying. Great, <clears throat> we've only got five more minutes. Everyone's looking very tired and they're like they've been defeated. <laughs> okay, there's a question. Hi, I'm Fatima from the Ethics Institute. Um, listening to this conversation, and I agree completely with Sarah and um, with David as well, I think just talking to the piece of the puzzle that's about governance, 
A lot of it is about, and it's a theme that's been running through this past day and a half, it's about political will, it's about ethical leadership, and it's about accountability. Because there's very clear guidance that's sitting in King, in the sector supplements to King, about what is governance, what is accountability. In fact, one of the things that the IOD, in fact, has done is set out criteria for the appointments for boards for state-owned enterprises, worked with the DPSA, but government didn't take that seriously. So it is about taking these things seriously and growing that distance between the shareholder and the board so that the governance and the oversight can happen. And if that oversight happens, then the intention is to lead to those outcomes which brings you functional institutions. But if you're hampering the independence of the oversight body, then it's not able to do what it's meant to do. So maybe let's just get back to some of the simple things, because our legislation has really good intent. But where we're failing is on the people that we're putting in place. So even, for example, something small, like the vacancy rate on boards. We leave that vacancy rate so for such long periods that the boards almost render themselves non-functional. But if we fix something simple like that, get the right people who have the competency, who have the diversity of skill, then the boards can function better. And perhaps just one last point is holding our ministers accountable. So when they make bad calls and they make bad decisions in appointing wrong people, we're not that great at holding them accountable. So for me, a, th a theme that's been running consistently since yesterday is really about the, the ethical leadership, the political will, and the issues of accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima. <coughs> that was a very useful note to end on. Um, <coughs> thank you, everyone, for your participation. And, um, and um, yeah, it's lunchtime.